Technology, right? right. We're talking technology here. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I love when we get together across campus. There's so many of us doing so many different things. I would like to give you guys the challenge to make sure you meet people you don't know while you're here right now. Let me just see a show of hands. How many people here are students? They don't get up this I barely get up this early. <laughs> Faculty? Staff? Researchers of other types and ilks? People from outside the UCLA community who came in here to find the warmth and happiness of our environment? Uh, would consider themselves North Campus? South Campus? Any? No. <laughs> Not quite on campus. We have people all over the place. So I'm going to give you the suggestion while you're here today is please meet two people you haven't met otherwise. For me, it's always the, um, there's all sorts of cool things going on across campus people don't know about. So I was, I was asked to bring uh, some of the work that I'm doing, uh, which is really looking at the impact of smartphones on our lives with music and then other things I'm doing. Um, I enjoyed this Surat picture added to um, putting smartphones in a traditional environment from an a old photo or old, uh, old painting. But smartphone smarter choices without the question mark is what was in the discussion. I might actually then leave the question mark. So this is going to be in some ways a cautionary tale discussion today. Um, but how are smartphones and personal assistants impacting essentially how we live, our decisions, how we interact with marketing, and how we design our lives? All of you, I assume, have smartphones in this room, some of which you are staring at while I'm making the introduction. <laughs> so my question is, how do we live a robust digital life? We have these devices in our hands. Hopefully, they are helping with our lives. How do we live a robust digital life? Are we living a playlisted reality, which I'll talk about some of my work in that regard? Are we living in a short playlist making decisions? Or are we living a bigger, immersive digital life, giving us more options? And how can we improve our decisions, whether it's for work, research, home, family, and not fall into what I will call the default? There are a lot of naysayers in this space. Some of this has been fairly recent. Some of this has been last year. Andrew Sullivan, in an article in New York Magazine, I used to be a human being. Uh, we all understand the joys of our always wired world, but we are only beginning to get our mind around the costs. Well, last week, or about a week ago in The Guardian, our minds can be hijacked the tech insiders who fear a smartphone dystopia, and an extensive article about people in the tech space who've been designing smartphones who are forbidding their kids to be on smartphones and cutting that out of their own personal lives and environments. And just this past weekend in the, New, in the Wall Street Journal, how smartphones hijack our minds by the famous Nicholas Carr, author of The Shallows, um, what is happening with what smartphones are. Well, let me pick up a few of the threads as a suggestion on how to be designers, researchers, users, to think about the human side of what we're talking about today. Um, in our connected world, and this is, was uh, done a couple years ago by a Facebook intern mapping simultaneous connections on Facebook. But in our connected world, where did we think we were going when we're designing all of this? Um, you know, Future Shock was telling us we would be in a world of accelerating change and having a hard time coping. Some might agree that, that uh, Alvin Toffler was fairly right and possibly under right uh, in that observation that I, I grew up in an era where the ideal was I could walk into the holodeck, hopefully with Riker, that would be fun. <laughs> I actually got a chance to meet him a couple weeks ago, which was quite cool. He doesn't quite look this young anymore. Uh, but that we could essentially be working and living anywhere while we're in the midst of anything. And we are at the edge of that environment. What, what do we design for that environment? How do we think about the human side of that environment? Um, snow crash, who's read Snow Crash? We're kind of living snow crash. We're kind of at the front end of that, despite all the years of time. Though snow crash gets very woo-woo and surreal about halfway through the book. Uh, but what happens if you can uh, virtualize your environment? Ready Player One also. How do you think about what, how this all interacts with your real life? Um, 
you, of course, have the lovely phenomena of what a screen could be in your life, uh, fat and happy, uh, run by the corporate, whatever, uh, pumping your life into you from Wally. This is always I show my students as, please don't go there. Please do not design for this world. I would contest that one. I'll show you some screenshots of how we are here a bit. And then um, the attention span disorder of up, of a squirrel, that we are perpetually getting ping, binged, adjusted into distraction. Can we design for that, around that? Or are we designing that into our products and designs? And this is somewhat of today's cautionary tale. Is this where we are now? Where instead of being present, that we have an ecosystem that is encouraging everyone to be their individual broadcaster of their lives? Is this the highest and best value? How do we think about design, implications, socialization, and the fear of missing out that has become some of the design elements? Or is it this? This is a few days ago here at UCLA. Walking wonderfully from uh, Leskin across the, the sculpture garden area, walking over to the Young Research Library, and this was a large portion of the people I ran into were face first into their smartphone. Not looking up, <laughs> connected in, audio block, standing in the stairwell at the library waiting for the elevator. Is this the life that we've designed or we are designing when we're looking at, the, at what we're creating here? This is a photo from about a week ago at Santa Monica Place, three young ladies, wonderfully out in Santa Monica with each other staring at their phones. Um, I posted this on Facebook. My husband then criticized in Facebook, okay, so they were face first in your phones. You took a picture with your phone, and then you put it up on Facebook. <laughs> I've told him he may not comment on my Facebook post anymore. That's, that's kind of the conclusion. Um, and this was a picture that was part of a presentation I did at South by Southwest a little bit ago, uh, which was a whole series of photos at the Metropolitan Museum of Art of people who are in this beautiful space but essentially had teleported themselves elsewhere and elsewhere. Uh, all series of pictures I also took in Central Park of whole slews of people who were face first into their devices. Is this the world we're designing for? Will augmented reality help so I can be doing the same thing but looking at the art and part of the environment? Or is this kind of the norm we now have kind of set for ourselves? We're in an environment now, um, and we'll be talking extensively about, of course, smartphones across the day, but about 81% as of the end of last year, according to Comscore, uh, of people in the United States were on smartphones as their delivery device, and, uh, as a percentage of phone usage. Uh, Nielsen's 360 study has shown that over the past two years that we've gone up an entire hour a day in smartphone use. Interestingly, um, this includes time spent in all media doesn't decrease for multitasking, so some of this stuff is overlapped. But we haven't reduced by all that much. The red is live TV. The green is AF, AM, FM radio. Yes, we are still listening to AM, FM radio. Uh, but we've had an entire going from an hour a day average to over two hours a day average in their study in two years. Uh, this is eMarketer's data saying that we're up to three hours um, a day in the green is mobile with a slight decline in desktop and laptop. But we are, and this again, doesn't subtract multitasking. But we are spending a big chunk of our days face first, pinged in, connected. And these slides, I'd love to share them with you. I'm glad to share them afterwards. Feel free to take pictures, though, another part of our modality with our smartphone. Um, DSCOUT last year did a study of 94 people to see how often they actually touch their devices. The average user per day, 2,600 times a day, were touching their smartphones for an average of 145 minutes. For their heavy users, 5,400 times a day, just touching the bleeping devices as they went through their day for a combination of 225 minutes. Um, of that touch time and that activation time, that over a quarter of the time was in the Facebook ecosystem, of which includes WhatsApp, Messenger, and Instagram, and 20-ish percent were in the YouTube ecosystem with the other 700-plus apps sharing the entire rest of the pie. 
So we have some concentrations of attention, marketing, human life, selling our souls, I mean contribution <laughs> into what we're doing. And I say in part selling our souls because some of the input output's emotional. It's not just mental. It's not just time. So this was a, a group called um, Time Well Spent looked at an app called Moment that they had a group of people, um, 200,000 um, Apple users, to be essentially saying, what's your emotional state as you're using all of these different apps? And interestingly, the ones on the right, which are the most unhappy responses we spent more of our time with. Interestingly, Grindr's at the top. <laughs> Candy Crush Saga has two of the top five, or Candy Crush has two of the top five, but Facebook actually is one of the top unhappiness contributors, and yet we are contributing our time to that. Um, Calm and Headspace, does anybody use Calm or Headspace? Interesting tools um, that are trying to actually calm you and make you happier while you're in your digital place. Uh, Google Calendar, oddly, has a 99% happiness rate. I know I curse at mine, so I'm not quite sure how that, that is at the top. Um, Audible, interestingly, is in a happy place. It's a big part of my life. Um, Evernote, I love Evernote. Um, but what is a robust digital life, and, and what are we trying to do with a robust digital life? Whoop. I may need, hold on, I might have this. So Tristan Harris did a TED talk fairly recently talking about this. I want you to imagine walking into a room, a control room with a bunch of people, a hundred people hunched over at desks with little dials, and that that control room will shape the thoughts and feelings of a billion people. This might sound like science fiction, but this actually exists right now, today. I know because I used to be in one of those control rooms. I was a design ethicist at Google, where I studied how do you ethically steer people's thoughts. Because what we don't talk about is a handful of people working at a handful of technology companies, through their choices, will steer what a billion people are thinking today. Because when you pull out your phone and they design how this works or what the, on the, what's on the feed, it's scheduling little blocks of time in our minds. If you see a notification, it schedules you to have thoughts that maybe you didn't intend to have. If you swipe over that notification, it schedules you into spending a little bit of time getting sucked into something that maybe you didn't intend to get sucked into. When we talk about technology, we tend to talk about it as this blue sky opportunity. It could go any direction. And I want to get serious for a moment and tell you why it's going in a very specific direction because it's not evolving randomly. There's a hidden goal driving the direction of all of the technology we make. And that goal is the race for our attention. Because every news site, TED, elections, politicians, games, even meditation apps, have to compete for one thing, which is our attention. And there's only so much of it. Now, I do suggest that you enjoy the rest of that TED talk. Let me see. Oh. Get back into again technology. Um, he has a whole thing he's now created um, called um, Time Well Spent. And he's got a whole campaign now working with designers across Silicon Valley and across various other um, uh, technology design teams to take a look at how we actually are respectful of our users' time and attention in the design phase. And claims to have about 5% of overall designers he's working with saying, let me step into that question. Let me think about how I am being respectful of the time and choices of the users and the, what I'm providing them in their work and their lives. And a lot of his conversations, there's a whole piece in Thrive Global recently about this, is looking at that we are creating menu-driven choice architectures for people in most of the technologies we create. And a lot of people have been sort of trained out of looking at choices that were not on the menu, stepping out of the default. 
Now, I stepped into this thought process because I started in 2010 teaching at what, before there was the Herb Alpert School of Music, at the Herb Alpert School of Music, a class on internet marketing and branding for musicians. So I was working with musicians to try to help them figure out how to find their fans, how to find their audiences, how to build community. And I was beginning to realize that my own students, wonderful 20-year-olds in my classes, were making their life decisions based on what was showing up on their smartphone menus and not understanding what was happening under the hood. That I would ask an average classroom of 40 students, can anybody explain to me how Google works other than I type stuff in and magic happens and there's an answer? And out of 40, I generally got two who could tell me anything else. I'm now on average at zero. So we're getting into this default mode, but the thought, I have a screen that provides me all the answers I need for my life. How do we help people be smarter in this regard, which is one of my missions right now? We look at this in music and realize there's a mass transformation that's happened there, training people to be very much playlist decision makers, and in many ways the product itself and not the music. So we're seeing business intelligence teams coming into most, most major music companies. We have a whole new playlist things going on, which I'll talk about in a second. A lot of work in predictive analytics, trying to see where and how people are going to be making decisions. Whole new tastemakers. And somebody knows what you did yesterday, what you listened to, where you were. So what we're finding is some really big changes from the ubiquity of having the device in our hands all the time and a, a totally changed relationship with music. Um, that location-based data is being collected based on also what I was doing, what I did before and after I listened to the song, my implied emotional state, and that's now being sold. That our tiny decision screens are creating little information bubbles that are little choice sets that people are then making little decisions around. Um, we're having audio bubbles where people are plugged in from the just the walking across UCLA video, lots of people who are creating audio areas where they're tuning out to the rest of the world. It's greatly impacting what's happening with music. And as um, Amber Case originally coined with Sam Cyborg Anthropology, we're carrying our brains around with us and we're trusting that that little digital brain is helping us make better decisions, remembering where we've been, telling us how to get around that car accident with ways. Um, making our, we're, we're handing the defaults over to what we're carrying with us. How do we think smarter about that? How do we decide smarter? In the music world, we've gone through a really big change, and this is a, a chart um, that shows the volume of units of what people have been consuming in the United States going back to 1995. In 1999, we had the wonderfulness of Napster come in and uh, create an entire new ecosystem, which is not on here of, of uh, non-reported consumption illegally. But we had a tremendous drop-off on CD unit sales. The scale is staggering as the drop-off there in the blue. Digital album sales were gradually available legally, but really didn't make up that difference. Digital downloads, mostly the beautiful iTunes people, stepped into some of that breach with a legal model. But we are now at more than 50% of music consumption in the United States is happening, and, and it, I'll say this is actually a skewed perception of it, is happening um, as digital flow, as digital data that is going through our smartphones. And it's training people on how to be and think. Um, it, I say it's misleading. This is a conversion to try to figure out how to look at some equivalency. So an album is one. To get to an album with the downloads, it is dividing by 10. The volume is tenfold of what it would be, but looking at an equivalent dollar amount, a replacement value. The multiplier, I should say the divisor, um, for the streams is 1,500. So in terms of flow, we've got a multiplier of 1,500 on the half the business that's trying to translate into some kind of an equivalency. We have a flood of data coming in with music. And a vast majority of it is coming through smartphones. So what happens? We're now seeing that there's lots of businesses that have sprung up in the music business 
to take a look at how do we create discovery from both the social media connection with this stuff and simply the streaming that more than 50% of tickets are being bought from awareness created by both streaming, uh, separately streaming, and um, through social media. They were having playlists being a gigantic part of how this is being consumed. People are creating recommendation lists for each other. So then when they find the music in their lovely smartphone, this is of course my mic control, but my lovely smartphone, that I'm taking other people's choices and suggestions and decisions and tapping them for my listening pleasure. And I'm becoming a curator. It's almost not just the modern radio, it's the modern cassette tape that you used to share with your friends. What's happening though is these playlists are beginning to drive consumption in a very large way and have become a whole new industrial complex. You have Spotify who's taken that data of what we listen to and what we do and has turned around to brands and has said, okay, we will sell the emotional state that comes with those playlists as the new means to get to people for advertisers who are seeking to advertise into relaxation, romance, workout, parties. I'm still kind of wondering about what I'm being marketed during romance. That's possibly a whole nother conversation. And connecting to the rest of the web, be it Facebook pixels, be it whatever, so that everything you're doing on the web is connecting to your behavior that's being sold by the playlists you listen to. We are the product. And our friends are the product. It's not just, if you take a look beyond music and with music, that we are being activated by our emotional state and the music we're listening to, we're also being sold to by what our friends are recommending. We're making decisions. The far left bars are what's happening with people using search engine for discovery to buy a product. But our social networks are activating to be buying the product. The blue bars to the darker blue bars are 16 to 24, largely our student population that are even more looking at social networks to make purchase decisions. And what's happening in the world of Facebook, another major activation from the pie chart we saw earlier, is that if a brand publishes a post on their brand page, that one to 2% of fans see it. Um, if they uh, sponsor a post or do a paid ad, they're really lucky to get one to 2% of their, of their target audience using lookalike audiences and other great things. But if a Facebook user posts a pub, pu publishes a post about the brand, 35% or more of their friends and family see it. So Facebook has now recently come out with the fact that they are encouraging brands to actually promote posts that people do that are then commenting on their product. So I know for a while now that with Facebook, that um, if they were wanting to do a Honda promotion, for example, that they were actually not just telling me Honda was great, but finding my friends who owned a Honda and nudging them through various tools to comment on their Honda and how much they love their Honda. This is getting to be that friends are now um, part of the marketing element to get through this cluttered attention and to feed us options for purchase in our smartphones. In the past year, we've actually had 26% increased engagements per post but many fewer posts per user, something Facebook is not talking about, that people are stopping commenting as much and more becoming consumers of other people's suggestions and a seven-fold increase in user-generated content, um, in engagement of brand-generated content that's in people's stuff. So it's getting to be a migration really quickly to us spending that time face first in our phones, um, enjoying fewer people's comments, and more and more of the effort to get brands into those, whoop, brands into those contents. So we've become the attention economy. Our behavior, whether it's finding out, you know, taking recommendations from Foursquare and getting us to go to restaurants, or our retail visits now being tracked and nudged to get us to have behavior through our phones, we, our attention is what's being bought and sold, and not just in music, not just in retail spaces, but let me tell you the story of another space I've been looking at, and that's job search. Outside the university, I was um, talking with various companies, including um, Road Trip Nation, What Colors Your Parachute, trying to find out why our students aren't knowing about the great resources other than going into the job search engines. 
um, to find out how to find a job, how to be looking at what's going on. And so interestingly, I started finding out that the vast majority of leads you'd find in search for jobs were all dragging you to sites owned by Bold, The Muse, uh, Balance, which are owned by about four different companies that are all funneling information that you're getting and the attention directly into Indeed, LinkedIn, uh, and other forces. So a very narrow pipeline, and so all the great information out there for job search is buried not to be found unless someone's recommending it. And then I found, hold on, let me back up one. Now Google has stepped in to have Google for jobs, so they're scraping all of that to create a gigantic attention funnel to just get you into immediately the job search sites and not going into broader resources about what's available to find employment. Very narrow funnel. So the whole thing of search in the customer journey, the pathways of how we discover and we find, are not necessarily paralleling the how I discover great things for my digital life. How do we break this? Or how do we create awareness that's bigger or design into a broader design set? Um, I'm encouraging, and my challenge to you is to rethink in both your work you're doing, your personal lives, how to be much more open about the input into your lives. Right now, people are using phones largely for filtering, discovering, recognizing information. Um, I'm working on a lot of programs about how we think about storing, recombining, recalling, and connecting. A lot of the 20-year-olds in my class somehow think that a hyperlink is permanent and should, it will always be there as to information and rediscoverable. And how we intentionally have our output, and hopefully that will be some of our conversations today, in terms of the emotional context, what we're getting out of our phones. Are we choosing to be using positive emotional states with our phones in the design of our VR spaces, in whatever we're doing, are we thinking about the intentional input, output? So we're also be creating new defaults. We're creating new defaults in how we consume content. More and more we're finding that people are headphones on, creating bubbles around themselves at work, in the office, you go into some open office plans and everyone's headset on. Um, increased streaming at work. We have closed audio environments and there's studying being done about silence in homes. You have some homes now that are totally silent as people are all wearing separate audio devices and not having a shared audio environment. How do we design into that? How do we design into live experiences? Um, this is a sign from a concert about two years ago. Um, so that they're actually in 3D, to be live, to be present. What are the options we're thinking and creating? As we're creating new virtual reality pathways, um, how are we thinking about what that means for the human connection, the input, the emotional input, the framing we're putting? Or if we now have all the arcades that are coming out, and has anybody gone to zero latency yet? Very cool, untethered experience with people. How do you think about the human connection side? Um, and where do we go from here? We're going to be talking, I know, about some of this stuff today, but now that you have, whether it's Snap or other folks who can digest the back end of your smartphone connections and be reading where you are, is this a positive? How do we design into this? Um, if we now are having, and this I'm spending a fair amount of time on, a lot of our choices being not just a small screen, but what comes to mind for natural language processing and talking to the three Alexas in my home. We unplug them when we have private conversations. But companies are trying to figure out not just how to market into the tiny screen, but how do I market into your decision process for what you're going to ask your Google Home or Alexa to do. They're thinking, how do I have my bots talk to your bots to be part of the decision pool? If, if you say Alexa, play Ed Sheeran, how do they decide what to play and who benefits from that play? And there's a lot of work happening in this in the music space. And a lot of these devices are going into cars and going into hotel rooms. How do we think about what it means then to be having choices and decisions made in spaces that may or may not be yours using these devices? And 20% um, of mobile queries were made via voice in May of 16 for people with Google Assistant. It's now up to 70% as of May of this year. We are being trained to be creating vocal playlists. Who's making those decisions for us? 
So my Contest Music has been somewhat of a bellwether. We've walked down this path already. We've been training people for you. Thank you very much. What are you going to be thinking of in terms of that training and those behaviors, the trusted behaviors, in this playlisting world? You know, is it that the immersive everywhere music, adding date and location, looking at how we market into lifestyles, playlists now being the new radio, someone knowing what you did yesterday, and the fact that we are the product, what can we learn from that? How can we learn personally from that? How can you kind of, you know, think about your life? Are you in a digital fish tank where you keep taking the lure? How do you design for this? So Tristan Harris, his solution here is thinking about people's time as valuable. We need our smartphones, notification screens, and web browsers to be exoskeletons for our minds and interpersonal relationships that we put our values, not just our impulses first. People's time is valuable. We should protect it with the same rigor as privacy and other digital rights. And he's standing very strongly to get designers and other people to think about the choices you're making for other people's defaults, other people's decision sets. I'm really big still on the input output. How can I think about this personally? How do I make choices? How do I think about silence? How do I think about how I train undergraduates? How we create music environments? And how I think about how my students will be building lives in the future. So please live a robust digital life and connect it well to your real life. Thank you very much. Any questions? We have some time, I think, left here. Or thoughts? For those of you not on your smartphones or other digital devices, yeah? Oh, there's a microphone here. Hi, thank, thanks for your talk. Um, I would characterize a lot of the things that you described as very negative, at least from the point of view of the consumer. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts of whether uh, those uh, addictive qualities will increase or decrease as we're moving into new media where we're dealing with uh, augmented reality or we're dealing with new interfaces like voice interface. Things going to get better or worse, stay the same in your opinion? How many people think they have enough time in their day? Not enough time in their day. So in many ways, I consider it a trade-off. Um, that negative in the fact that a lot of people have taken the bait for the default and are not making the question. And, and in terms of design, that we've accepted the default, we've accepted the terms of service, and have picked up the consumerist baton extensively to say, I want uh, easy, I want the easy button in my life. Um, and so it's not as much negative as cautionary that I think there's tremendous power in these tools and devices. Um, I spend generally in the class I teach for generally it's third and fourth year students here as undergrads, um, starting with the point that they don't get this at all to the fact by 10 weeks later they can design complete data platforms and uh, marketing plans and community design, once they kind of crack the nut. Um, what I'm finding though is a lot of people aren't thinking about cracking the nut all that much. Um, that a lot of people really have the perception. I'm, I hesitate to use my husband as a case study in this stuff. He always becomes a case study in this stuff. But he wakes up in the morning and the first thing is a smartphone in his face. Um, there's lots of studies about ways to make this a better environment and better opportunities. Um, in talking to a lot, I do a lot of work in, in audio and VR and talking about what emotional state are you creating? How are you thinking about the control design in the space? Um, several of my friends are working in the, the AR heads-up display space. Um, are you thinking about attention span, cognitive load? Are you actually asking the questions in design? Are you doing it early enough? So, so to me, it's a cautionary tale more than a negative tale. Um, when I talk about this in the music industry, they say, well, this isn't new. It just was the record labels who were controlling everything and telling you what to listen to, and the 12 tastemakers on radio who were telling you what to listen to. And we believe those curators, and the new curators are just the old curators replaced with something that we think is more egalitarian. 
Um, I'm not sure it is. Um, I work with a lot of companies that design this stuff. Um, and, and part of it is your average person doesn't quite get how the deck is being moved. Thank you. Very helpful. Over here. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want you to jog with the microphone. Thank you so much. I, like you, think that these are amazing tools, and, uh, and yet there's a lot of cautions. I attended Social Media LA, um, amazing. But the, the clear motive of most of the people in the room at Social Media Week LA is, is the profit motive. And I'm really struck by what you said about your students that it used to be two out of 40 who, who understood what was happening behind Google, and now it's zero. When they and start, <laughs> when they walk in my door. Right, but that's really concerning. Um, I mean, I know there's a lot of people on the internet who are more savvy, but there's also a lot of people who aren't. And I'm in healthcare, I'm in the School of Nursing here, and so the, what I want to ask you, about, I've never heard of Tristan, um, Harris, the design ethicist, which seems like a really positive influence that could actually make things even better for everything, including the profit motive, but a little bit more moral and ethical stance on that. Um, do you have any other suggestions? Uh, because that's an incredible lead, and uh, out, outside of taking your class, which would be wonderful, and Tristan Harris, is there any other suggestion that you would put forth for us? There's a there's a small number of voices that are very vocal in this space. And in fact, reading the Guardian article and reading the Wall Street Journal article, they also note a lot of the people who've been doing a lot of other research in this space. Um, I would contest that it would be really fascinating at UCLA to be doing some of this work and research and pulling it together. Um, I know several researchers at other universities, I'm assuming there's people here that I haven't even touched on, that are heavily looking at those social and structural impacts. There's more voices, I hear this on the healthcare side. Um, Yes, Digital Hollywood is going on this week. Oh, what's Linda's last name? I want to say Darnham. She just spoke at Stanford. She's a fielding faculty member, has been doing extensive work looking at this in VR in healthcare and looking at the mental health issues and design issues. Um, there's a lot of people who are having this conversation. It might be good to have this conversation broadly here. And you are from which part of the school? School of Nursing. School of Nursing. Okay, excellent. And the gentleman asked first, what part of the school are you from? Okay, excellent. Okay. I would say Linda Dernheim, um, but I will. I'm Gigi dot Johnson. Actually, I'm Gigi, but I'm Gigi dot Johnson at UCLA dot edu. So if anybody wants to follow up, and I'm glad to give people the slides as well. <clears throat> they tried to sell me satellite radio like like three times a week for like the first three months, and I, I still won't pay for it because I'm an old school person who likes the music I like. If I hear a song on Apple, I will go buy it, but I'm not like a playlist person, and I don't want I don't want to hear like the next song they think I'll like. I don't want it. So I guess I'm wondering, but I don't know like how, what's the what's the model? Part of it is because I don't understand what is the model of how people who create music are making money from these satellite radio playlists, this new environment. And since I don't understand it, I don't want to be a consumer of it yet. Maybe that's why. But I'm just curious, like, how is that working? And, and then also, how when you say they're selling emotional state, can you say a little bit more about, sure. like, to whom and for how much? And, or like, I mean, not exactly, but, like, the model. Okay. So um, right now, the, part of the reason the music business is coming out of the tank is the fact that people are getting more and more used to both listening to ad-based music media, that there's a decent um, sense, 0.2 to 0.8 cent per play, so some tiny fragments of, of money, that are now aggregating into big numbers with billions of plays. So um, when that, when you listen, and it, whether it's on, Sirius XM, uh, that actually 
It's a small mount per play that goes through a thing called sound exchange that goes to the label. We spent about two hours in my class yesterday um, with guest speakers trying to explain the money pathway. But there's little money pathways these micropayments are going through. So getting into a list on SiriusXM, which is curated by mostly human beings, or Spotify largely that is both um, algorithmically curated and or human curated, and actually the algorithms are scraping tastemakers from blogs across the web and looking at their historical accurate. So getting on this stuff is both a knowing the right person, continuing power plays, or um, some playlisters scraping the web as to taste and looking at tastemakers and pulling it all together. There's little micropayments that are going back through the system that are then getting to the artist. So there's a whole new business on how do I get to those influencers and get in the algorithms to get my music to be loved. And for a lot of artists, it might be that 60 to 70% of the listening for their music are from these playlists, not people like you who are curating your own stuff and making sure you've sideloaded it onto your phone to listen to in your cars. So there's whole new businesses to, to be able to get in the right place to be found to be on the playlist. Are you saying the good ones or the people? Yes. So in terms of the playlister, sometimes it's it's a person. There's one guy on Spotify who's doing rap caviar on Spotify as an individual. And he's the one dictating fate of an entire genre by what he puts on rap caviar that then gets discovered. That is heavy, heavy listening volume. It's new aggregators so that you're not instead listening to your radio station and then knowing from a friend casually that something's happening. It's massively measured and aggregated. Now on the emotional side, I then listen to Rap Caviar. Um, who has Spotify in the room? Who pays for Spotify in the room? Well, actually, most of, some of the same hands. Most of the same hands, that's good. Um, if I'm paying for it, I don't get ads. But for everybody else, there's advertisers then. And so those advertisers saying, OK, I actually get the data now. If I listen to Rap Caviar, here is the whole demographic underbelly of all of this and the aggregated details. But I can sort of see, well, I want people who are listeners to Rap Caviar, but they're also um, doing workouts. They're, they're looking for something that is 125 beats per minute. I mean, it's really coming down to the, I would like people who are just in the LA basin, who are 18 to 24. And so they're able to get somewhat granular down to, I want people with that emotional state who have a propensity to buy a car. Or are near West Side Pavilion. Or are looking to be applying to college. I'm selling medications. And I'm looking for people who seem to be under these types of stresses. Um, add time into these playlists, but then connecting it to your other behavior on the web to then see if you activate that you go do what they are hoping that you'll do based on them putting that ad in front of you. And you ever clean your cook cookies? You ever thought about cleaning your, get the cookies thing? It's now a pixels. It can just give all that stuff. See, I don't mean it to be a cautionary tale as much as the fact that we've become the product. That it's not the music we're listening to, it's the data about that that becomes the value and gets to drive you to do something else. So maybe buy a $100 concert ticket, or a piece of merch, or a car, or a college education, and your friend. And what part of camp, you don't have to say your name, but what part of campus are you from? Amy Cohen, I'm from Department of Psychiatry. Ah, excellent. So, um, I, this has nothing to do with my job, it has to do with me personally. So um, recently actually I was meeting with Rose and we were talking about things and she was like, you know, you gotta turn off your Alexa, you gotta, you know, you gotta like have multiple emails and sometimes you're a guy and sometimes you're a girl and all these kinds of things and I, I left driving home really? like, oh my God, they know everything <laughs> about me and Rose may know everything about me. Um, well that's a whole different question. Right, that, they're both concerns. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I noticed you said, you know, when we have private conversations at home, we unplug our Alexa, you yeah. know. And I'm wondering, is there any way to control to any degree how much they know about us? Is that possible and still be connected? 
there are choices to make. Um, there are there are choices to make. Um, there are people who are uh, journalists who have to think very carefully about how they're found, discovered, what's on their phone, what they carry with their phone, putting their phones in RFID on pouches so that they can't be scanned from the outside, that they don't want the information they've collected and the people they're communicating with to be connected to. Um, if someone wants to find your data if, and, and crawl into your stuff, it's, I mean, the White House finally now has people turn their phones in as of this week when they get onto the premise and put them in lock boxes instead of letting people walk around with listening devices um, on the White House this week. Um, how much I ask, I ask for, for sort of two reasons. I mean, we work also for the Department of Veterans Affairs, so the federal government. And so we have federal government phones in addition to our personal phones. And we are very careful about what we do on those phones. Um, but I still believe to some degree that they can link that to my other, you know what I mean? I mean, oh, maybe yeah. I'm paranoid. But I'm like, I think they can like link just because I don't do it on my federal government phone. Yes. Like, I think they can link that via my name to all my other data. I come back to this as it new. Catalina Marketing has been doing this with our charge card data and our loyalty cards and all this. We've been giving our information away. Experian, of course, has been collecting a bunch of it, including now what pets you have and everything else. That evidently has been up for grabs. Um, do you have many identities? Rose you could do that as an experimental thing. Um, there are people who are for... There are people for a living who are, yeah, there are people, uh, a few years ago, I should say quite a few years ago, when I was, when MySpace was popular, I created four different identities who were me at different ages and, uh, and life experiences. So the job I had at 27 and me then, and, and I would actually find a completely different engagement depending on how I position myself. And to me, that's a more interesting question I deal with a lot with my students and have for years. Who you, who they think you are actually impacts what is offered to you. So um, I, we did an experiment with uh, a group of my students actually gosh, seven years ago now where they all did a search together um, and all compared what they found. And my students who are African American living in certain neighborhoods in LA were getting totally different marketing messages than their compatriots who lived in a different community and had a much more limited set of choices offered in certain areas to them. To me, it's more that what the environment is that you do sign up to be communicating in will actually affect your life choices. So you can cordon yourself off. You can turn your phone on only. You can take your battery out. I mean, you can do all sorts of different things. But you are participating in a robust digital life. What are the choices of the inputs and outputs? Uh, I mean, your searches are kept ad infinitum by Google. Um, you can do other searches that are not Google. We still have like, what, 70% of people in the United States are using Google and even more in other countries. Um, what are your inputs in your life? Let alone can they find out what you've been looking at and listening to? Yeah. And what part of campus are you from? Regular person? I'm a regular person. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I find I find it's great that you are drawing a parallel to the music industry, which gives the whole conversation a platform. Um, I, I want to know: Well, if we put our phone down and not use it for certain hours a day, is that what we what we what do you suggest that people do in that time? And where where are you getting it to return to? I mean, I came from a generation where this before the dig digital age, and uh, People create things in music, enjoy their references in somewhere else. Whereas, and what would you say to younger people now when all their references are the last 10 years of music that they hear from the playlist? And then I know we need to move on. We'll make this the last question. Yeah. Um, silence is interesting. There's actually a lot of research around silence. For a lot of, um, I do a lot of things with 7th through 12th graders. I run First Tech Challenge Robotics for Southern California, like I need something else to do with my life. And um, 
we talk a lot about what it means to be unplugged and what to do with silence. And, and Cal Newport's done a bunch of really cool things on deep work, about how to think about unplugging and being deeply focused for a while. Um, it's something that is almost a, a superpower to build now among younger people who are perpetually plugged in, tuned in, and connected in. Um, it's affecting how we teach and how we work with kids as to attention spans. But what do we do with the time that we're unplugged? I'd say I stay unplugged for most of the day nowadays. Um, I have to set expectations with people that um, I've got about an hour twice a day where I will tune in and tip in instead of getting in this repeated whip spin of emails and connectivity. So I can actually be and do and be out with people and making things and creating things and teaching. And, and um, it's an interesting social change for people that I work with that I'm not immediately available. Think of what we're now doing to each other's time and issues. Um, to me, the great stuff is happening when we're unplugged. So I'm not quite sure otherwise how to answer the question other than it is, you know, whether it's being present and mindful and engaged and looking at the other people in the eye instead of at the phone. Um, it changes the dinner table. Um, I mean, it, 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 I'm gigantic about human connection and creating shared joy and experiences that are not necessarily digital. So I don't know if that answers the question as much. That was my last question. There's a hand back there, though. Yep. Last one. Um, yeah. My question is pretty simple. Um, uh, I believe, like, uh, Russell Barkley at UC Berkeley basically, is an ADHD researcher, basically said, like, you're born with a finite attention span. It's pretty gener genetic. So I'm just wondering, is, um, there's like apps that's like, that is designed to be addicted, like, you know, micro, like those free w freedom games, et cetera. What does it mean to be, a, like, design an app to be addicted and then another app to be informative, and engaged, and productive? Um, I'll leave you to look at Tristan's stuff as follow-up. Maybe that's my homework assignment for everybody as I invite the next panel up to the stage here. Uh, but in many ways, it's a, do I, do I finish the loop or do I immediately lure you with autoplay into the next option? Do I make it so, do I gamify the experience so that you're then looking up an hour later and suddenly going, an hour went by. I'm, I'm a parent of a grandmaster in Overwatch, so I kind of watch this in the whole Overwatch space. But we're, you know, part of it, the whole gamification is incentive for you to stay in the loop and not closing up. Saying, um, I'm asking the other thing what they mean to be productive and still be engaged. I'm actually more interested in the other side of things because we experience gamification every day and it's, it's obvious out there, but what does it mean to be productive and still have the choice to actually continue to use it? I will leave that to be a fabulous rhetorical close and suggestion to everyone here. Thank you very much. <laughs>